crowd that lined the streets of New York in August 1926 had all the gaiety and expectation of people going to the movies. The newsreel cameras brought smiles of delight. The crowds were there for Rudolf Valentino, the great lover. For women in the 1920s, he personified the menace of forbidden love. But the crowds that August waited in the rain to see their idol in the flesh. For some, it would be the first time, for all, the last. Rudolf Valentino was dead. His body was lying in state in Campbell's funeral parlor. Valentino's effect on women astonished even the men who produced his pictures. A typical publicity stunt measured women's pulse rates as they watched the Valentino film. It was all due, they said, to his earthy origins as an illiterate peasant in Italy. But like everyone else, they misunderstood Valentino. He'd come from Italy as a young man, but he was neither illiterate nor a peasant. We were not a rich family, neither an aristocrat one. We were in the middle class, but in quite comfortable position. My father was a veterinarian, a health officer, and a biologist. The majority of of a story not truthful that he came here because he was a poor boy an immigrant to make money to try to find fortune no in his life he was always guide and push by spirit of adventure he used to say italy is too small for me when he arrived in new york at the age of 18 valentino was hard up like so many immigrants, he had a photograph taken in rented clothes to reassure his family back home. And in order not to worry my mother, when he wrote, he went to the Waldorf story and wrote a letter from there. But he didn't sleep there. He was not a guest of the Waldorf story. On the contrary, he told me that sometime he even slept in the Central Park. Eventually, Valentino got a job at a New York cafe, dancing with the customers. He never took in his life any dancing lesson. But he had a natural grace in dancing. When he went to Hollywood, his Italian looks condemned him to play the gigolo in an endless parade of screen villains. In 1919, director Al Parker gave him an important role in Eyes of Youth. His career was improving. His private life was miserable. His wife, actress Jean Acker, had left him. And that Christmas he was depressed and lonely. I said, what are you doing for Christmas? He said, well, nothing. I said, haven't you any place to go? He said, well, no, I don't. I said, well, you sure do. I said, you're going to come home with me. This is our big night. My mother and father will be there in the presence, and you're going to be right with us. He said, oh, that'll be marvelous. So we made him Santa Claus. I had a, a red cape, and then we put a red hat on him, and we got cotton and put a white beard on him, and he handed out the, um, the presents. A lot of people have... Uh, it's made me laugh. A lot of people, you know, said, oh, how well they knew Rudy and what they did for him and all that sort of thing. And I think, mm, 
Well, they, uh, there was one Christmas they forgot about Rudy before he, he was anything. After he did the Four Horsemen, that was different. Valentino now entered film history. He was cast as Julio, an Argentinian playboy. Director Rex Ingram exploited his skill as a dancer and his frank sensuality. At this period, the tango was regarded as an indecent dance. Ingram used it as a symbol of open eroticism. Four Horsemen was scripted by June Mathis. She had spotted Valentino in Eyes of Youth. She became a close friend for the rest of his career. The film established Valentino as a new kind of screen lover. But this success did not bring him instant stardom. He played straightforward roles in other Metro films. Camille with the Russian actress Nazimova. The most impressive thing about Camille was its sets. And Valentino was surprised to learn that their designer was a young dancer, Natasha Rambova. Her real name was Winifred Hudnut. She was heiress to the Hudnut cosmetic fortune. Valentino fell in love with her. And the romance perfectly suited her ambitions. She was determined to become a major producer. Valentino joined famous players Lasky and was featured opposite Agnes Ayres in The Chic. These shots were taken during the production. In the title role, Valentino was a sensation. He played an Arab sheik who abducts an English girl to his desert tent. Natasha considered the story utter trash. Valentina was not happy about it either, but he mesmerized most women who saw it. His acting may look strange today, but some people saw that he conveyed ideas with his eyes which they daren't put into words. The very quality which appealed to women upset their husbands. Valentino inspired envy and ridicule from American men. They were not very understanding about Valentino. He came along as the first of the great foreign lovers. See, that was one of the interesting things about Gable. Every American man was perfectly willing that his wife should be in love with Gable. Because Gable was what he liked to have been. 
but they were not willing that their wives should be in love with this Dago. The Sheik made Valentino a top star. Natasha agreed to marry him. But Valentino's marriage ended in jail. The laws of California required a full year between divorce and remarriage. A bigamy charge was dismissed. But Natasha raised the question, why had famous players Lasky allowed its biggest star to go to jail? Valentino's next picture, Blood and Sand, would be made in Spain with no expense spared, promised the company. But they shot it cheaply on the back lot. It was a success, but Valentino and Natasha felt cheated. They were depressed still more by the young Raja. He had the right, though, of uh, an approval of a story, which they recognize in the contract. But actually, practically, they didn't do it. And that starts the fight. Valentino walked out on his contract, refusing to appear in any more cheap pictures. But the fans kept writing in for photographs. We had a printing box, the negative, and we used to print a hundred a night, dry them on the floor and towels and God knows what. And his signature was on, it was a stamp. So. And we would send a postcard saying, if you want a photograph of Woody Valentino, please send 25 cents for the cost or whatever. And as we were getting between eight and nine sacks of mail a day from the fans, Natasha and I and Rudy, we used to open up the letters and count the quarters. <laughs> and in between pictures, it fed us, <laughs> you know. Valentino and Natasha were out of work and broke but they felt they were fighting for their artistic integrity. A public relations man, George Ullman, found there was nothing in his contract to stop Valentino making a personal appearance to her. He arranged for the couple to promote a beauty preparation. Valentino and Natasha gave dancing displays, and wherever they appeared, vast crowds greeted them. The climax of their act was the tango from the Four Horsemen. He was so absolutely hounded by publicity. Crowds would gather. I've heard tales of women picking up cigar butts in the streets and cherishing them. It was just insanity. As part of the Mineralava deal, Valentino had to judge local beauty contests. A promoter called David Selznick exploited Valentino's absence from the screen with a film of his appearance at Madison Square Garden in New York. He released it at great profit, for fresh footage of Valentino was gold dust. This enormous popularity obliged Adolf Zukor, a famous player's Lasky, to conclude a settlement. Mounting debts obliged Valentino to agree. He and Natasha took a European holiday. These shots are from the home movies they made en route. Valentino was already Italy's most famous emigrant, yet he was not as well known in Italy as he was in the rest of Europe. And he had just come back from Rome, which he had visited for the first time since becoming a big star. And Bibi said, tell me, Rudy, what did they think of you when you arrived in Italy? And he thought for a moment, he said, Bibi, in Italy, I was just another wop. The influence of Natasha affected Valentino's new film, Monsieur Beaucaire. Critics were quick to notice it. The film was too arty, they said, and too self-conscious for Valentino fans. They expected that quality of menace, and they didn't get it. Valentino's co-star was Lois Wilson. He was a, a very serious worker. R Rudolph didn't uh, kid on the set and that sort of thing. He was a very generous actor to work with. Charming. 
and I had known him before. I knew him quite well before we made the picture as a person. And I just found him a very charming, lovely person with a terrific sense of humor. Valentino displayed humor and elegance in Beaucaire, but the fans expected passion. We found a, a delicatessen no, or a store in, in, in the, uh, on the plaza here that sold very, very long spaghetti in a cardboard box. It was about six or seven feet long. And we used to buy those boxes and uh, never break the spaghetti. So before Woody prepared them and he had boiling water, he would stand on the ladder and slowly move those spaghettis into the pot. Valentino entertained important executives. When they would start eat, uh, trying to cut it with a knife, they said, oh, no, in Italy you never cut that. You wind it on your fork. Well, how are you going to wind six feet? <laughs> six feet of spaghetti, you raise your head and wind, and when you're done, you wind again, and everything falls down. And we had a lot of fun doing that. But Valentino had no sense of humor about his wife. He submitted to photographs like these because he loved and admired her. Over him, she exerted an almost hypnotic influence. But now, her interest was fading. So was his career. In the hope of putting new life into the romance, he bought a house, Falcon Lair. He gave Natasha a free hand with the interior design. But Natasha never spent a night in the place. To conceal the broken marriage, they went in front of the newsreel cameras and played a farewell scene. Natasha was going east to make a film on her own. They would never live together again. Valentino signed with the United Artists to make The Eagle with Vilma Banke for producer Joseph Skenk. Directed by Clarence Brown, it proved far more successful than the films Natasha had supervised. Valentino played a Russian bandit married in the death cell before being led out to die. Valentino began a romance with Pola Negri. He spent money recklessly. His friends asked why. I have a hunch, he said, that it won't make a damn bit of difference. He drove recklessly. He had several near-fatal crashes. Natasha sued for divorce. He became more and more depressed. To ease his money problems, he determined to make a surefire hit, a sequel to The Sheik, and was delighted to have an old friend, George Fitzmaurice, as director. Fitzmaurice had a sophisticated understanding of Valentino's appeal.
Valentino's influence on men's fashions encouraged the wearing of wristwatches and slave bracelets. And when a powder machine appeared in a men's washroom, the Chicago Tribune blamed it on Valentino. Why didn't someone quietly drown Rudolf Guglielmo, alias Valentino, years ago? Well, it was very unjust. Valentino was a, an extremely manly man and could probably have taken most of them if it came to having a good fight, you know. He was a, a fine swordsman, good fencer, and there was nothing of the powder puff about him. This one particular thing really made Valentino go quite stark mad. He resented it just terribly, and he said to me, this isn't fair. It is not fair. I mean, I have none of those attributes. I'm a man. I've always shown it. I have been madly in love with only one woman, but I've always been in love with her. And to, to make belittling pink powder puff remarks is a very unjust thing. And if the guy will come out here, I will tangle with him face to face. The man never appeared. Valentino staged an exhibition bout under the eye of Jack Dempsey. The pressures on him were enormous. Fighting his divorce, facing bankruptcy, coping with a gastric ulcer, and now fending off attacks in the press. A few days later, he fell ill and was rushed to hospital. They didn't want to take any responsibility of making an operation on Rudolf Valentino. So they were waiting for some big surgeon, well-known surgeon, experienced surgeon, to come along. But being on Sunday, they couldn't find anybody until six o'clock. Precious hours were wasted while the fever mounted. When the surgeon was found, he discovered a perforated ulcer. The first two or three days after the operation was getting better, all of a sudden he had a turn for the worse because the peritonitis developed and was the one who killed him. Valentino lay in state at Campbell's funeral parlor. A great many of them really had had a lot of feeling and affection for Valentino. So it was a crowd filled with emotion and with hysterical emotion that you weren't at all sure what they might do. Hysterical crowds behave badly at funerals. Seven days later, the funeral. Ben Lyon took charge. I received word one day at the Ambassador Hotel in New York from the florist in the lobby that they had had a phone order from Miss Pola Negri to place a blanket of white roses across the top of the casket six feet by four, and in the center, in one foot letters in red roses, P-O-L-A, Pola. Well, let's make it look like an opening night for her. A premiere or something. I said, under no circumstances will that, will those flowers be placed on that casket. And they weren't, and of course she was furious and put up a terrific fight, and I said, they're not going on. And uh, the whole thing turned out to be, if you remember that she fainted and fell down and had to be carried, it was a, it was a premiere for Paul Negri. Among the Paul bearers were Adolf Zuko, Marcus Lowe, Rex Ingram, Douglas Fairbanks and Joseph Skank. Natasha Rambova did not appear. There was to be a second funeral in Hollywood. Alberto Valentino joined the train for the five-day journey. We went across country and it was amazing. You probably, you can't believe me, but it's true that to see the, the people that they came and the, and the way in which they were trying to show their shock and their affection for, for 
I was awake early in the morning because it was just dawn. And the train stopped. And I was informed that was a, a group of uh, people from Erie which had come with guitar, mandolin. The great majority were Italian living here in this country. And they they just asked me permission if he, they could sing and play some of the Italian song for the memory of the It was very touching. It was the biggest funeral Hollywood had ever seen. At the Church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills, stars like Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks paid their last respects. Skank collected two one million dollar insurances on his life, they didn't even buy him a grave. He's living, he's living, he, he's resting in a, in a, in a in the box that belonged to June Mattis. So if she had, she had free, whatever they call those drawers where they put them in the wall for herself, for her mother, and she had bought one for her husband at the time, Balboni. And, uh, so when Rudy died, says, if, if you have no grave for Rudy, you can use the spot of Balboni's, and he's still there. Valentino was 31 years old. His death gave him a status he had never sought in his life. He had become immortal. 